So we are coming back and we are at item number 11, which is going to be review of policy. So we're going to break this for a motion into two separate, one uh, second read, and then we'll talk about the ones that are first read because we have quite a few. Mm -hmm. So can I have a motion? Let me just see. For, can I have a motion to adopt as a second read policy 5150, which is school admissions, policy 5151, homeless children, policy 5500, student records, policy 6700, purchasing, policy 6700, R, which is purchasing regulation. So moved. And can I have a second? Second. Okay, and now these policies, we had no revisions after the first read for policy 5150 which was student admissions, policy 5151, which was the homeless children, policy 67R, had no revisions after first read. However, policy 5500, which is student records, and policy 6700, which is purchasing, had some minor revisions. Is there anything, Jen, that? Uh, the, the revisions were really editing revisions and okay. didn't change content at all. Okay, does anybody have any comments or thoughts about these policies as a second read? Okay. So motions on the table, all in favor? Okay. So now I need a motion to adopt as a first read policy 4526, which is technology network for education, policy 8630, which is computer resources and management, policy 9645, which is disclosure of wrongful conduct whistleblower. So moved. Okay, a second? Second. Okay. Anything we need to um, know? If you'd like me to, the Technology Network for Education 4526, that was updated to include information about um, seeking staff of students, seeking staff approval for a, any kind of cloud-based software that they might be using, and staff seeking approval of the Director of Technology for that. So really just not enabling kids to um, utilize that, that software. And computer resources and data management, we need to start taking into account that thing, data is not just stored on computers, it's stored on remote servers as well, so language was included for that. Um, regarding the disclosure of wrongful conduct, the whistleblower policy, um, there has been new NISBA information that they wanted us to include staff testing misconduct as an area to um, include in this whistleblower policy. And original document that we had, the original policy talked about reporting and retaliation, but the new policy that we've adopted, we're hoping to adopt from NISBA, has disclosure, um, investigation, complaints of reprisal as different components of it, so it's more elaborate. And we should make note that in approving 9645, the new NISBA model for uh, wrongful conduct whistleblower that we're at the same time um, terminating or deleting right. our old policy 9100. Yes, yes and good. the reason we do that is because we keep our numbered system aligned with what the NISBA samples are and for some reason our original was 9100. Okay, and these were all vetted by the policy committee mm -hmm. recently. And as a matter of fact the whistleblower policy was also vetted by council because there were questions regarding investigations and who investigations and complaints should be given to. Just, um, I just had one couple questions. On the computer resources and data management, and I'm not sure if it fits here or not, but it's just more of a question actually. Do we have a policy on email archiving? And if so, is that you know, communicated to people? Because some organizations keep emails forever. Some have a policy actually of deleting every six months or you know, have some kind of regular deletion. I don't know what the laws around school districts, but maybe just something to think about. I'm not, again, I'm not sure if it's in this policy, but I just it triggered my thought when I was reading it. Mm -hmm. it and then also use of, we, this is also We do in practice. Okay. The other one is um, use of email for personal versus work. And again, just the question, like is there a policy, is there not? And it's in the that, AUP. That we do. Yes, in the, um, and you'll notice that these policies like computer resources and data management, but actually more so um, technology network for education. We've now cross-referenced the AUP 
mm -hmm. on those and it had not been before. So that information would be found. Got it. So to Scott's point about the uh, number of years of holding on to this, you said mm -hmm. we do it in practice. Does that need to be put into a policy? Is this something that the policy committee should take a look at? It wasn't a NISBA recommendation for this particular policy, but I right. don't see a problem in looking into it and seeing. I'm sure we don't have. I, I, I don't remember sure. ever seeing it. I don't ever remember seeing a policy, it, yeah. uh, but I can look into practice and ask and come back. Okay, so that would be. Yeah, it's probably great. useful to yeah. see yeah. what like the funding is and yes. what the state association thinks, yeah. and just have. If it's not recommended specifically, I would recommend not doing it. Mm -hmm. It's not recommended specifically in the in this sample. But but I mean it's still worth investigating yeah, along the so lines Scott said. Yeah. Okay. The other thing which is just purely an edit um, is well, kind of, is on the disclosure of wrongful conduct, in some places we say come to the Board of Education, some places Board of Education presidents should just be probably consistent. I think either way it's fine because if it goes to the president then it goes to the full board, but it's just in the in, in the, the document it, it says in like the whistleblower. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so that's just, exactly the reason why we vetted this through council because we wanted to know that the ones. chain of command had to be specific for each of those. So oh, so for different ones, it's purposefully different. It's yes. purposefully. Ah, okay. And there's a Got word it. designee language in there, right. which mm -hmm. I'm sure gives you a little more flexibility too. You could send it to the auditor. That's and when you say school attorney, is that like known who the school attorney would be? Capital S. Some of this is in case it's about me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But I mean, literally, is, is it like does some employee even know who the school attorney is? I mean, you can know it was through the board. It's published. Yeah, yeah it we is. it's yeah. actually in our reorg meeting we yeah, have we the attorney spelled out there. It would also allow the board president to talk to the attorney without talking to me if if I were the person of concern. Got it. Likewise, with an auditor, you could go straight to one of our auditors to investigate if Greg and I were in cahoots on. Yeah, in fact, I probably audit, shouldn't even say this stuff. But the auditor reports to the Board of Education directly. Right. right. Okay, any other comments? Okay, motion's on the table. All in favor? Very nice, nice work. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Okay, and it moves us to new business. And we have 12.1, which is the demographer report. Yes. Dem demographic report. And can you help me with the, with the uh, presentation? Uh, okay. Do you mind? You need something? Up. Yeah, the uh, long range planning study. I'm not sure what you I can call summarize because I've <laughs> listened to these reports for <laughs> 10, 11 years now. It's going to be almost like it was last year, <laughs> except where it's different, and it might be a little different. <laughs> Got it. And there's no telling, we'll, really, we'll whether it will be a little different. Keep on top of it. Because yeah. <laughs> that pretty much it? That's close. <laughs> that is close. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. <laughs> it's entertaining anyway. While we're waiting for this thing, I, I forgot about the. It's it's that darn kindergarten class. That's the one that you you know. Yep. It's a big roll the dice question mark about. Yep. Yep. We've been fortunate in our efforts in ascertaining the number of kindergarten students mm -hmm. through putting something on the website, inviting parents to start the registration process earlier, SOS and doing outreach. The SOS yeah. is really, uh, you get 90, more than 95%, I think, in the SOS for that that bus ride, that practice bus ride. Exactly. <laughs> start up like a Chromebook. <laughs> no, it doesn't. That's true. Nope. I should seconds. say we've been talking a little bit about improving the technology in here because uh, well, this is all awkward. <clears throat> and then also, if you're sitting on that side, it's awkward. Um, I kind of like the light in my face. That's, yeah. why, that's why new, new board members <laughs> come <laughs> down the side. <laughs> now we understand why we're here. So we don't want to have, like, six I, screens I, I in this little room. Just our hazing period. We're working on it. Yeah. So. And it's such a tight room, you know, having screens you can see and that the audience can see is a challenge. So. We're going to get a 3D hologram in the middle of the oh. That, that would, would do it. Yeah. That well, would do it. Ideally, <laughs> if Obi-Wan. you just click a different feed, instead of taking a video of the screen, you press a button and you get on your feed the same thing that's on the computer. Right. That we could do now. We've always wanted to make sure it was a, an actual live record, but we're not required to do that. Right.
We're booting up. You're booting up again, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Let's yeah, get in there. So have we, a quick question on the thermographer. I mean, we use the same you for or many can I go to board to do that, or is it a BOCES out of Long Island? Yeah, there's a BOCES that specializes in this. Okay. And, you know, I mean, all joking aside, yeah, I, there's a, even if you find out that there's a continuum, the real purpose of this is more for long-term planning. Yeah. Right. I mean, we could skip it a year and it wouldn't hurt us at all. Nothing dramatic is going to happen. Um, it's all projection mm -hmm. statistics, so it's all based Plus on you the have some, you know, geopolitical events. Well, 2008, it all changed. Yeah. 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 We used to have on staff a demographer, didn't we? No, 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 we had a census. We have oh, yeah. oh, census. And the report has improved over the years. It, um, they've done a much better job connecting with the town on uh, development that's underway and what stage, okay. and they can project based on you know the information they get from the town. It used to be the clicker, didn't you? When, when I started here, there was no. Uh, information it share in at all, and uh, click us up. And you know we know it's in November, and and it was often the time where you, you know in August yeah. you'd have Is twenty five new now? kids, and you'd yeah. have to hire try a new teacher in August. It's not a good time to be interviewing, sure. and. Uh, you know, they say, well, way, right? all these great kids are a little bit unknown. different this night. I've been building my house for two and a half years. Right, you got the permits for your and, and, and I can tell you, everybody on the street, the age yeah, of their the kids, and when they'll be in the district, because that's there. That's been there for years. And that, you know, once you pull that information, it's pretty easy to put it in and make predictions. We should probably cut a lot of this out. Hey, Tim, we're getting there. Make a note to talk to Brian about editing tonight so that people don't have to watch. <laughs> yeah. I turned the camera on way before we started. So oh, no. <laughs> There'll be Is a lot of editing. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, all right. I say. Do you mind being I'll, my... I will be it. <laughs> I, can't, I can't talk in okay. I'm talking at the same time. So uh, this is the long-range planning study update. We call it the Demographers Report. It's a report that we make uh, to the board every year, and it is kind of the kickoff for the budget. Uh, one of the best things that it does is it gets us into the mode of thinking about the budget, the fact that you know these numbers are who we're planning for, um, ultimately with the, with the budget. Um, it is as as. Um, as I was saying informally a couple of minutes ago, primarily a long-term planning tool. It's unusual that there would be anything surprising in, in a new year, in a, in a given year. Um, although, the, as, as we also said, that can happen. Um, when the economy uh, crashed in 2008, we saw a dramatic change the next year, and it's one that we're still coming out of. Uh, so we found the report very useful. The approach to demographics, I'm not going to go through it in great detail. Um, if you look at the last two bullets, the accuracy of the K-12 to projections were within 1.2% last year, which is very good. But as I said, essentially, the demographer's report is projection statistics. They're just taking the numbers that exist and pushing them out uh, 15 years without any, um, without any knowledge of what trends could happen that could change it. The accuracy of the K-2 projection last year was 4.5 percent. We had fewer students than they predicted we would. And that's, that's all pretty typical. They will consider a lot of different factors, uh, birth rates, home sales. They collect a great amount of data. Um, and one of the values of this is just having that data, having information about home sales, being able to see how, how they're changing, um, the prices that homes in the area you're going for, birth rate in the area, that's all great information to have, okay? Uh, there are three key things that we want to look at this year. One is births. Births within the district have ranged between 88 and 126. However, in recent years, they've dropped to between 61 and 74. We don't know exactly what that means, 
likely what it means is fewer young people have been moving in. We know that to be true. Younger people are the ones who are having, having babies. Kind of makes sense. Population did experience a gain. That's the entire population. Um, and part of uh, the, the birth rate data is the fact that Byram Hills is experiencing a graying phenomenon. The average age uh, in the district, the median age, was 41.9 which is a tad higher than Westchester County, high, much higher than New York State, uh, and much higher than some other states. Uh, one of the most interesting thing, of course, is how many houses are sold and what the prices are. The number is particularly important to the district more than the price. Um, you can see that in 2005, uh, we reached a peak. That was the heat of the housing market. By 2009, it had dropped off considerably. However, by 2013, it had built back up, and it appears, based on the 2014 numbers, which are only down a little bit, that the number has stabilized, uh, which is uh, uh, positive for us because a stable population is certainly easier to plan for and to budget. Um, our class size guidelines have been in effect for quite some time. We're very satisfied with them. They range from 18 to 22 students in kindergarten, to 22 to 25 students in grade five. And all of our uh, classes are at the low end. However, you can see by the numbers, um, you couldn't actually get rid of a section because it would push them uh, considerably higher. So they're all at the low end, which is comfortable. Um, our current enrollment, um, I realized after I, I did this that um, what I'd like to look at first is 2015 going from left to right. That number of 487, remember that Coleman Hill has three grades. So 487 means there are 162 students per class average. Three to five is also three grades. So that's a little bigger, about 10 students more, 173 per class. Six through eight is three grades. So that number is even a little bigger, 196 per class. And uh, 9 through 12 at 875 represents four grades. That's 219 per class. So what you see is, you know, we've talked a lot about enrollments declining, um, but it still isn't, hasn't gone through the middle school, and it hasn't uh, hit the high school until it will only just begin next year. So um, there's a tendency to say, oh, the numbers are going down. We can cut, we can cut, we can cut. We do cut when we can but the, uh, the, the population bubble has not gone through the entire district yet. In fact, this high school class is the largest they've ever had. Uh, the next thing to look at would be the K-2. to There were 147 students in kindergarten in that, in that, uh, in that group of, of K-2. to The kindergarten represented 147. 166 were projected, so that was lower than, than anticipated. And of course, kindergarten is always the, the mystery. We don't know about those kids until they get here. And finally, if you look at the far right-hand column, what you will see is as we project through 2019, the number goes down uh, quite a bit next, well, uh, yeah, about almost, well, about 75 students next year, and then gradually after that. And the demographers uh, prediction is that kindergartens will eventually become pretty stable between about 145 and 155. If they become stable, then that will become all of our grades. But it's going to take some years to get there. So nothing dramatic, as Brett predicted, <laughs> based on his experience. Brett was projecting from the projection statistics. Um, next steps are we use this data with the administrative team. They're very important for planning staffing. Staffing is an enormous part of our budget, of course. Um, we'll use this data in the planning cycle. Um, we've already begun, Jen and I meet with every principal, go over staffing in detail for their building. We've already begun that process. And uh, uh, Jen described the system we use now for monitoring kindergarten to try and surface numbers earlier so that we can plan better. And finally, these are also useful for planning facilities, just making sure that we are going to have enough space and that we have the right kinds of spaces. So um, it's a very brief report. If you have any questions, certainly. So I, I yep. just, you know, years, 
few years from now, we are going to see this decrease in the high school. I know we've talked about this in the past. At what point do we have to start really planning for what that's going to look like as far as facilities and uh, programming? Because it's pretty easy to manage in the lower schools, as you said, if yeah. you just take out a class. High school and middle school, well, actually, middle school might not so be so hard either, but the high school becomes quite a challenge because... Well, actually, the middle school is pretty tricky because yeah, of the teams. teams. The teams. The teams. And, uh, <coughs> you know, teams is a, a system we're very committed to. I don't think there's a, any other way to run a middle school. So um, at some point, uh, we'll want to look at that half team mm. at the middle school. That might be a solution for us. And Eventually, school, at, at, at the high school, there are two key things to look at. One will be programming. Um, However, we've always, at the high school, sort of let students vote with their feet. So the, uh, you know, state doesn't give students much choice as far as math 9, 10, 11, 12, or English 9, 10, 11, 12, or social studies 9, 10, 11, 12. There are a lot of electives at the high school, and we'll be looking to students uh, to vote with their feet. We'll main, my goal would be to maintain any program that's still drawing well for students. I think there's probably this is going to be complicated, and maybe not in a bad way, by the STEAM initiatives. You know, I see electives shifting at the high school, and I see some, um, maybe even whole programs shifting at the high school. Well, maybe even what classrooms look like, you know, judging And definitely what classrooms look um, like, yeah. Presentation earlier. Yeah, okay. yeah. We're planning for what classes might look, we don't know what classes will look like, but we're, um, we're already anticipating that. And we're trying to use some of our lab renovations to see what kind of furniture works. So before we put it in 80 classrooms, try and get a sense of what, what, what works well with students in the uh, you know, new ways we're teaching using Chromebooks and uh, more cooperative learning like what these students were talking about tonight. So we want to do that very carefully. We don't want to go out and buy a whole bunch of furniture as if we know what education is going to look like in 20 years. I do think most of the changes will be handleable by furniture, that we aren't going to need to construct you know, new facilities. So I guess if um, in the high school, if you get to a point where with decreased enrollment, there's an elective where before you were able to fill a class, now there's still interest but just half as many kids, same percentage of kids maybe, but just half as many, and it becomes somewhat uneconomic to have that class. I guess the question becomes, are That's there... That's happened before. Yeah, and are there, are there any creative alternatives around almost like quasi-independent studies or you know, ways in which you can still have the same offerings but just in a slightly different way. Maybe there's you know, less one-on-one -on -one instruction time, but still one-on-one -on -one instruction time supplemented by something else. I mean, since we have maybe a couple of years, it may be just worth thinking through some of that. Because it, yeah. just, it does seem like there'll be an issue. that'll be where the issue is, right, on the electives. Keep in mind that in New York, um, seat time is a requirement of courses. So at this point, it's, it's difficult to do independent study or online learning very much. Um, I don't really see it being a crisis. We've had pretty dramatic changes even in the last three or four years. There are courses in the last couple of years that have died. Um, and, um, you know, with electives, you know, typically you're not saying to somebody, you want to be an engineer, we're going to wipe out programming. More often you're saying, you know, we're not going to have uh, Typing um, class. Typing, well, that would be an easy one. <laughs> but sometimes it's even, you know, uh, poetry or public speaking have kind of gone out of fashion and they die. Um, current events courses tend to come and go. That's kind of the normal cycle of things. And if you wanted to get in current events and it's gone, um, it's not as though your career's lost. No. Right. So we'll, we'll, we'll play that out by ear. We certainly want to produce the programs that give students the greatest opportunity um, and we want to protect the programs that reflect uh, strong student interest you know those we absolutely want to protect um, it's going to be it's going to be a really interesting time what are, what are we talking about how many years do we have before this really well, the next, school, year, the next year is going to be different than this year. Yeah. You've we got don't, the biggest class but graduating. Still big, but there's still big classes in the high school. Yeah. We're HCC, probably talking HCC another next year it impacts, it seems like, based on the numbers. Oh, yeah. Like yeah, high school 1718, but HCC even 16. Yeah, 2008 plus. Yeah. 
Yeah, the right. numbers alone There's don't the... tell the story. You have to hit that that critical mass. Right. You know, that really lets you. Okay, well, you, you guys are on dramatic. top of it, and you'll obviously let us know. And you got to yeah. remember at the high school, some classes have, you know, upper 20s in them, and some classes have 14. As it is. Right. Just some it, of the that's classes. just the way it is. We planned it that way. Yeah. You know, the high school had the disadvantage, I suppose, of being the last school to get the big enrollments, and they didn't get them until, you know, the economy was already in trouble. So we've let the high school numbers rise up quite a bit. I, I anticipate a couple of years just to let them level off, get them yeah. and, to a size that's. And miraculously, this class acceptable. that we saw today, this, this senior class, our biggest class, they're also incredibly exceptional, this particular class. So I guess the crowded classrooms and hallways affected them positively. <laughs> There's not much evidence that class size makes a big difference. Not in that class. In, in the older kids. And, mm -hmm. and when, in any kids. And, and when the uh, schools were built out with the 85% growth rate right. of the district in 15 years, that, that right. enormous uh, you know, hiring 20 teachers a year kind of thing um, there was a conscious decision not to build the facilities That's to right. handle the max number you always wanted to be a little bit stretched knowing that you know uh, well it might go down yeah I know that. so the, the guidelines actually are I was the high school principal when we were doing the high school the guidelines from the state are that you should have your classrooms full 80% of the time. Yeah. You know, 20% 20, 20 of your room should be empty at any given time. Not 20% empty all day, but, you know, right. your foreign language classrooms, your labs, you've got to have some flexibility. So what we planned um, was that when the population hit the peak, we would be at 100%. Mm. So, it, so we didn't overbuild, because mm -hmm. we knew it wouldn't sustain us. Itself, or if it did sustain itself, we'd have had to build more. Anyway. Right. You called it a bubble back then. We knew, right? We we yeah. suspected. It would be I guess the only the only other thing to watch for is that the one thing in the demographers report around Brynwood, which is the one big development they put, you know, adult. Seventy-one, I think, but seventy-one units, I think, is what the last one. Oh, seventy-one. Yeah. So it's down from what I. Yeah. Heard. The key, if we put together the, there are three developments. We do watch this, and we communicate with the town quite a lot about it. Um, Robin's on the liaison committee with me with the town. There are three developments that could, uh, that would, that would create a hundred units. Brynwood's the biggest at 70 some. There's another one where the old lumber yard was that'll have 30 some, and then a old 22 next door on old 22. Next door to Beehive on old 22 right. is about is 10 units. So that could create a hundred units, unless all hundred units are bought by families that have third graders. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> we can handle, we can handle them. Yeah, and, and Brynwood is, they're targeting, you know, Senior. between yeah. seniors, are you? Like, so even if everybody kids. had kids, they would be in all different grades. Right. No, right. I, I think it's broader based than that. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Good questions, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for doing that. Appreciate that. And that <clears throat> now brings us into a public hearing. So I'm going to officially open our public hearing. And uh, blah, blah, blah. public hearing to examine the plans to expand 242,645 from the repair reserve fund for the purpose of repairing the transportation department building. And I just want to say for the public that this was reviewed in two previous meetings. And this is not a new tax obligation. This, no. is, this is something that we've already approved. It's just a matter of where we're taking the money from. And Greg, will you just recap this briefly for sure. us and for those at home listening? Sure. What we've been uh, talking about is the funding options for the transportation renovation project. Uh, there are several sources of funding for this project. The first was the four phases that were approved by the voters as part of the operating budget. So that made up the lion's share of our, our funding. We also uh, received insurance recovery and scrap metal from the Quonset hut that had collapsed. There wasn't a lot of money there. Uh, we also have a funding source from our capital projects fund. These are small projects which have been completed, and it totals $141,000, a little over, over that to fund this project. And finally, we have the retirement contribution fund, based on what the balance would be of monies needed 
to fund the, the difference. The 242000 is money that's been set aside for a number of years for repair purposes. Um, part of this process is to have a public hearing, uh, give the public the opportunity to comment, and also uh, to give public notice, which we did back on December 2nd. Okay. So we've given the required notice for public input if there is any, uh, and then to actually the motion after the public hearing is closed will be to actually increase the operating budget by the same amount so we can have the legal authority to spend that money. So that's the other part of this. Okay, and so then with that, I open it to the public. Does anybody have any comments? Hearing none, I officially close the public hearing, and now I need a motion to authorize an increase to the 2015-16 two, the, uh, budget uh, in the amount of $242,645 to be offset by the reserve for repair. Can I have that motion? So moved. And can I have a second? Second. Any last comments or questions? Okay, motion's on the table. All in favor? Unanimous? Greg, thank you very thank you. much for all your work on this and uh, your good planning and your education to all of us on this. I appreciate that. Really, this is the last step in something that's been four years yeah. in the making. Is that right? More than four. More than four years. Really? It's been a long yeah. time. Yeah. yeah, so feels good. For those of us who are newer, we appreciate the communication around it. Thank you. I think it's, thank you. The community has seen this a lot. <laughs> yeah, but for us too. I mean, it's, 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 nice, it's a helpful. nice place to be at this point. We're really, we're really starting now, so it's, <laughs> it's great. Good. All right. So that brings us to staff reports and superintendent. Thank you. Um, Want to mention that I saw a. Shouldn't sound surprised, but I saw a fantastic production of *Midsummer Night's Dream* by the high school theater department, and I say it with a little bit of surprise, I suppose, because I don't ever think I don't think I have ever seen a high school production of Shakespeare where the students mastered the language so well. You could actually listen to them and have a sense they knew what they were talking about, and you could follow you could follow the uh, the plot. Um, they worked enormously hard on that because, um, you know, high school productions of Shakespeare can be really challenging to sit through as an audience. And commendations to the cast and crew and the director, John Lopez, for, for their great work. Um, primarily what I, I want to talk about today is an update on what's going on with state politics. Um, it's as though the tide went out, you know, they can't run away from APPR fast enough right now. <laughs> Um, last week, Congress easily passed, uh, you know, a law that's going to effectively take apart uh, No Child Left Behind from the Bush administration and Race to the Top from the Obama administration. And within days, the Senate had done the same thing, easily passed it, both sides voting for it in enormous numbers. The president has already said he will sign it the minute it hits his desk. Um, Artie Duncan has all but apologized. Um, and John King, our former commissioner, who's going to take Arnie's place, on is, an interim basis only, is quite quiet. Um, well, all this will get signed and everything before he gets in there, right? All this will get signed. Before yeah, I, I don't think he's going to be allowed okay. to do anything. Okay. <laughs> um, he's going to be he's, the acting commissioner. I don't think right. he's ever going to be appointed the commissioner of education. Right. So, um, you know, the question is, will New York ratchet down? because we're not so much bound by the federal law as we are by the state law. And typical of New York, they, took, they take whatever the federal government does and they add to it enormously. They double down. So the question is, you know, can the governor, who supposedly wants to find a way out of this, though he hasn't admitted it publicly, but the leaks coming out of Albany make it pretty clear that he's testing the waters, can he find a way out of it? The problem is, and the... Um, I met with the commissioner and chancellor in a small group meeting, about six of us invited them in. Um, they don't see a way that the education department can get out of this unless the legislation changes. Um, I met with Amy Paulin, who's on the education committee representing Westchester. She's a Scarsdale assembly person. Um, she has written a letter uh, which we supported uh, to the Board of Regents 
reminding them that they are the, I believe, the only body other than the legislature that can recommend legislation. For education. For education. So she has, um, is, is pushing them to provide the solution, be interesting to see if they do. Um, I've also met with her to try to meet with the governor's representatives um, to pressure him. Um, our sense, though, is that who he really cares about is the union and the opt-out parents. And um, he wants to make the problems go away, is, is what the rumor is. I mean, I suppose that, that may or may not happen. And we may find out soon, or we may find out the night the budget passes. You know, that's, that's how things work in New York. was interesting to meet with the new commissioner. She, um, she's got a difficult job politically, so I don't want to judge her too much. She did seem to want to hang on to some aspects of APPR. In particular, she wants some percentage of the state tests to count in teacher evaluations. Um, my preference would be if we just went back to where we were before all these, these laws. I don't think we need a new law. I think by definition they cannot write a law that will be good. I mean, it's just, they aren't One capable. One size fits all, you can't do it. It's not going to work. It needs so, to be more organic, right, from the local. Well, until, until uh, we got the No Child Left Behind money, we did it ourselves. I don't know if they're going to allow that because I don't know if they can keep their fingers <coughs> out of things. But uh, I do want to thank everybody who responded to my request to participate in the Governor's Common Core Survey as opposed to the Commissioner's Common Core Survey and the new Opt-Out Parents Common Core Survey. Um, the, governor <laughs> the Governor, had, when he set up his Common Core Task Force, said specifically that this was about the curriculum and he was not seeking uh, comment about the tests. But he got plenty of comments about the tests. Um, I think uh, the commission itself has acknowledged that though that wasn't their task, they're going to have to include something in their report because there were so many comments about the tests. So that's very gratifying. And we will you know, continue to monitor it and hope we come out of this a little brighter than we went in. In the, the governor's... Uh Commission is expected to issue their report any day now, right? I believe so, yeah. 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 And I'm, I'm guessing that's why the waters were being tested with leaks? Right. Intentional, maybe, float, float it out there as a trial balloon, see what happens. And encouragingly, though, the, a two-year moratorium was floated. And uh, if I were a betting man, which I'm not, I... I I think we had a good shot at uh, a moratorium. That would be great. A moratorium on uh, the assessments being tied to the to teachers. Yeah, yeah. Well, what's interesting is if you look on the New York State Allies website, they have this opt-in um, set of criteria, <laughs> and one of the and when you look through their criteria, I would say that many of the points have already been addressed yes. through lip service, at least from SED. But the one that's on there that's probably the toughest for Albany to get their arms around is, is a delinking, a decoupling of the two. Because clearly from the standpoint of the commissioner, she's been pretty outspoken that she still wants there to be a coupling. But then with the Cuomo leak, that could be part of the calculus here. Because if they don't fix that problem, then, then they still have a problem on their hands and they're going to be back to the drawing board again. So that's why there may be something pretty dramatic coming. There might be. Wow. And I think state ed, you know, I meet with the chancellor and I, I like her, um, but you know, her legacy really is evaluations with, that include student testing. So it might be difficult for the commissioner to let that go until we have a new chancellor. Yeah. May I jump the queue a little bit tonight on, and, and remind everybody or make an announcement about the education reform panel that we're going to do here in the district on January 27th because it's really about all these very same issues. Yeah. Um, uh, Wednesday, January 27th at 7 p.m., uh, whether it's at the high school or the middle school, stay tuned, but we'll be in an auditorium with a panel of uh, George Latimer will be there, our state senator. Um, I expect David Buckwald uh, to be on the panel as well, uh, Dr. Donahue, 
and uh, uh, we put out an invitation today to Judith Johnson, our regent, who um, we hope can join us uh, for an informative discussion on uh, where are we with opt-out, where are we with the tests, where are we with teacher evaluations, and um, it, it comes at a time uh, that'll be after the governor's budget proposal and all of his policies tied to his budget, but before the legislator, legislature actually votes on the budget. So it'll be a op real opportunity for people to pay attention and to get informed and to uh, uh, hopefully be advocates for their, their kids and uh, our district. How will this be communicated to the uh, greater community so we know about this? Well, it's a joint program. It's sponsored, uh, let me say it this way, the, the PTSA and the school district are co-sponsoring this program. So the PTA will have its uh, global email outreach, uh, but it really will be incumbent upon both the PTA and, and really the district to uh, publish it publish notice of this to the entire community and the question still remains uh, how um, aggressive we want to be in inviting our neighboring communities mm -hmm. um, I would think we'd probably want to invite Bedford Chappaqua Pleasantville um, and uh, because it's an issue that affects us all collectively and the more everybody is on the same page um, urging uh, changes of the same thing, uh, the, the, the better we're mm -hmm. all. We all Easy are. to, I'll, I'll do a blast at all. Okay. Yeah. All right. So all right. That's good. All right. So that brings us to our Assistant Superintendent for Business. Thank you. I'm going to discuss where we stand in the Affordable Care Act compliance. Uh, there's a lot of players involved. Jen, obviously, as HR, uh, Susan as a like, sounding board, and uh, working with payroll and human and benefits uh, as well. Um, the we started our compliance and report requirement began this past January 1st of 2015. Uh, we put in place a measuring system which is in-house, very simplistic, but we track people who don't have health insurance be paid on a hourly basis. If they exceed 30 hours per week based on the measurement period, they may be eligible for uh, health insurance. If they don't receive it, we can receive monetary penalties for that. So we've been tracking that on a monthly basis. Uh, we're okay with where we are in terms of that sort of penalty. Where we are right now is we're getting close to the end of the calendar year, which is like our W-2s that receive as employees. Uh, employees each receive something called a 1095C. It's so compact it fits on an eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper. Uh, and every <laughs> you can read that, but you'll all get one. Um, uh, it requires we're required to give this to all of our employees by January 31st of 2006, which seems like a long ways away, but it's 2016. Just, 2016. Six. Sorry, mm -hmm. it's just a few just a few weeks away. Uh, right now, there's we'll call it general panic by everybody uh, saying, well, our financial software that we use, which was finance manager in House Envision, they've been aware of this. Well, they have a system in place to report this by this date. I'm going to a meeting tomorrow morning with other local business officials, uh, eight in total, who have all the same uh, health insurance coverage and the same financial software to discuss uh, what we're all doing and where we stand in this uh, pandemonium, which, which isn't that bad, but uh, to say, what are you doing? How are you going to meet this requirement? Uh, we've also talked to uh, a consultant who has a company that does this. There's a lot of those firms around there. This is a recommended firm. Uh, I haven't committed to use that firm yet to actually produce these forms. I'm still hopeful, like Charlie Brown, that um, BOCES and finance manager slash Envision will come through at the last second and produce these forms. What we've been doing, uh, because we're considered self-insured, we're required to provide additional data on this form. The bottom half of the form indicates all the dependents. Uh, 
anyone who has insurance it says who the dependents are, what their social security number is, and how many months they have insurance. The form also shows if it's affordable, uh, it also shows uh, if it changed in any one month, uh, and of course identifies the Byram Hills, and there's a summary form that goes with this. Um, all things uh, working out, uh, we've been sending uh, from Swiss Chip, who's our health insurance company, a download of the dependents and, and sending that to BOCES via the sneaker net so they get a, a copy of it. Uh, they look at the compliance to see if it will be uh, usable data to go into our database, which then will be uploaded and be printed. So uh, I need to make a decision about this probably no later than 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. but. Uh, I'm going to see uh, what all of our colleagues are doing from local school districts from the Sound Shore Consortium and get with Jen and Bill and decide uh, which route makes the most sense. Uh, if, if you're not in compliance, the penalty is $100 per day per person. So it will add up to a lot of money very quickly if we don't comply with this. And the rules get tighter going into 2016. This year, you know, the filing, the filing, filing compliance penalty does not change. Not, IRS is not going to budge on that. So we have to get these forms filed. Uh, they do give you a error rate of 30% that you should have given assurance to but didn't. We don't have anybody at this point. Uh, next year, 2016, it goes to we have to have 95% of those eligible covered by this. And we still always have to keep in mind the Cadillac tax still out there for 2018 uh, it'll be here before we know it uh, so there's a lot of wheels in motion on this um, we feel that we have our data in good enough order and our system is even though we're considered a large employer by the IRS standards and self-insured we feel we have a good handle on the data we need to collect and to put together um, but I'm, I can't tell you right now if BOCES will do it through our, our, our financial system or if we'll hire a consultant who will take the same data and produce the forms. I, but I can assure you that the forms will be printed, they will be timely. Um, we're not, we're not going to miss the deadline and, and, and not make a good faith effort into getting everything correct as well. So uh, that's where we stand. It, it has been quiet in terms of trying to get to this point. I keep waiting for the panic to ensue. I think that's tomorrow morning, but um, everyone's, everyone's getting nervous how are we going to produce these forms with the information that we have right now. But we have, like I say, a, a good handle on what's required and we'll make a judgment call um, literally tomorrow. So we all know not to call you or bug you tomorrow, right, <laughs> until after 2 o'clock, right? <laughs> you're, always, you're always welcome to call. <laughs> Thank you. So that's, so that's the update. That, yeah. there's, nothing, there's, there's nothing to, uh, I do the worrying for you on your behalf. So uh, Appreciate we'll, that. We'll, look, we'll look at this very closely. Um, our goal is not to uh, get caught in uh, some of these penalties, which are just uh, negligence on part of companies that will get caught in these. Some you can't avoid. Mm -hmm. uh, the Cadillac tax would be a real challenge as a couple of years out. But um, this one is something that we can get, we can get this done. We have the wherewithal to do it. Okay. When do the health care rates get reset? And on the fiscal year or on fiscal the calendar? year? Fiscal. Okay. fiscal year. So we have to show the rates twice on that form. So, um, But the, the way that the penalties work for, for individuals, mm -hmm. if let's say someone goes to the health care exchange and they weren't eligible because they every, everybody will have one of these forms plus a W-2, the IRS will have this and say, hey, wait a minute, you said your health care was unaffordable. Your employer said it is affordable. It does have essential coverage. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to withhold your uh, tax refund until we're satisfied we got our, our our money back that you were subsidized with. So there's there's some true teeth in this, mm -hmm. uh, and people just can't go into the health care exchange and not have a potential penalty if they weren't eligible for it. So we meet we meet all the requirements that we need to for affordability and for essential coverage. So it's a matter of getting the form correct and out on a timely basis at this point. And, uh, you know, you mentioned the Cadillac tax coming in a couple of years. I uh, 
assume, I guess I don't want to assume, but uh, will we have an opportunity uh, to either renegotiate aspects of our CBOs that impact that or do a, uh, even if they're not up, we can renegotiate them because certainly our bargaining units understand that if there is going to be a penalty, it's in nobody's interest to be paying it. You renegotiate the benefits down and you use the uh, avoided tax to uh, increase a benefit somewhere else. The majority of the the union contracts expire uh, June of 2018, so the timing is good for that. But the contracts also allow us to work collaboratively to uh, renegotiate for health insurance. Perfect. And they're and they're they're all it have to be it have to be a, a negotiation, but it, uh, it does allow us that opportunity. And all the unions are aware of you. You can't not know about okay. this only tax. But I mean, it takes a year to renegotiate this stuff, so. Uh, You've got an eye on that, good. Yeah, we always start a year in advance. Perfect. Great. Thank you so well, much for that. Tim, did, did you have a report of the curriculum conversation? Yeah, the curriculum conversation okay. will serve as my report. Okay. Performance assessment. Thank you. That was a great report. And Jen. And I'll piggyback a little bit on uh, Greg's compliance theme, uh, as we like to remain compliant. Uh, and talk a little bit about interview committee training that I've conducted recently with parents, teachers, and administrators in the district. Despite the fact that we just received the um, enrollment projections and the demographers report, and we are just starting staffing conversations, it's important to the district that we have people who are trained to be on interview committee teams. So right now, currently, we have approximately 30 parents throughout the district who have been trained, and a majority of our teachers and all of our administrators have been trained to interview. Um, the interview training that was conducted recently includes what is the training interview process from the beginning to the end for a candidate who's going to come and be a part of an interview team. Um, what is the role of the interviewer and the role of the interviewer within the team themselves. And then also some legal guidelines regarding equal opp opportunities and discrimination regarding uh, confidentiality and the way we conduct an actual interview process. Um, just sometimes when we're looking at APPR and we're looking at recent legislation and we're saying, you know, we, we're choking on standards, this is something that should really be standardized and is throughout the district. So we're always up to date with who has been trained and um, continue our repetitive cycle. So the parents that are trained to be on this, is it many years that they are able to be on it, or is it every year? So, been... so we keep an updated file, and every year parents who have been trained will be contacted to be asked if they're willing to serve on the committee should they be asked again. They also understand that we're not in a, a hiring frenzy by any means, and you're coming and we're appreciative, but they may, you may not be asked. Right. Once trained, you're good. <laughs> you don't need to be retrained. Yeah. There is a little bit of a retraining on an interview day. We start by describing the process again and reiterating some of the main points so that everybody's aligned. Good. Stress is the, how we feel about people who are coming here to interview, our respectful process, and you know, valuing their time that they want to be a part of the biomass community. They need to know that through our communal thinking. Great. Any comments or questions? Okay. Thank you for that. And that brings us to board reports, and I'll keep it really brief. I just wanted to say that, um, I think you all know, I sat through a webinar on uh, later start times for the high school, and I know we're not revisiting this. I know the board's already made its decision, but um, I sat through a webinar on that. And, and basically, I'll just give you the recap. It was a school, uh, Glen Falls in New York, a slightly smaller school than our district, no busing, smaller territory. It worked for them. They were able to overcome any of the issues, but they're obviously a very different type of school. So I sent everybody the link if anybody's interested in, in looking at that. If you don't have the link, let me know and I can send it to you. And the other thing is uh, Scott, Brett, and I went to the NISBA, no, sorry, Westpot networking breakfast with uh, Regent Judith Johnson. And um, that was interesting. And I won't belabor too much. I'll just read a few of the points that uh, she made that I thought were interesting in Scott and Brett. Feel free to jump in. 
Um, one of the things she said was that they're trying to realign the Board of Regents for what they should really be, which is really a deciding policy based on real research and not merely advocating for an issue. And she said the new regents that are on board now are ready to debate, and in the past that hasn't been the process to debate the policy and the issues. So that's heading in the right direction. And she also wants us to know, Judith Johnson wants us to know that regents, especially Judith Johnson, they're not pawns of the teachers' union, as been stated in the press. And um, although they, you know, we have a lot of respect for teachers, she wants everyone to know that they are not pawns. And if a moratorium is granted on teacher evaluations and the Regents has the opportunity to um, take the next step in that, she feels that the Regents should focus on creating a system that doesn't fire, it's not punitive, but rather is based on continuous improvement. And she also said it's important to note that this movement isn't only because of the opt-out movement from parents, but really because the system of evaluations, it doesn't work. And uh, in her opinion, gap elimination restoration probably won't be supported by this governor. And she asked that we, the, the public, continue sending letters, not form letters, but personal letters, to your legislators, the governor, uh, chancellor, ex the regents, et cetera, saying that we're not against teacher evaluations, but that we wanted student learning focused. Those are the main points that I took out of that. I don't know if you have any other points you guys want to add from uh, She. Um seem to really look favorably upon a departmental uh, bill, something coming out of the Board of Regents uh, legislative uh, proposal. Um, and also there's 16 regents on the board and they got seven to vote against APPR. Um, nine would have kicked it out and, uh, and uh, and there are two regent positions open this year. So Why is that large? Anybody interested? Yeah. So mm -hmm. there, uh, uh, she's, uh, I'll echo the sentiment that she's optimistic that the Board of Regents is uh, moving in the right direction from being a relatively sleepy rubber stamp type organization to now an active participatory policy development uh, organization. And that's, that's good for us and good for the state. Yeah. Good, thank you. All right, and that is my report. Does anybody have any board reports, committee reports? Yeah, so earlier <clears throat> this evening, the communications committee met and we discussed and, uh, and reviewed some uh, informational pamphlets regarding the budget that would be going out to the community. Any major changes from last year? Uh, the changes are pretty slight. Not major, but there were a few. Okay. Thank um, you. At the BHEF, just a quick um, synopsis there. So there's a meeting tomorrow night of their board, um, which will attend, and they launched the campaign for STEAM, mm -hmm. um, which I think is going very well. And I think the video that the district did was great, because it really does crystallize what the purpose is and how it's going to be implemented in the in all the schools. Um, and then uh, I think the only other point is their spring gala is going to be on May 13th. Mm -hmm. That date is set. That's a Friday, I believe. Right. Thank you. Anybody else? I know there is a policy meeting coming up this Friday as well as a town liaison meeting. Brett, did you? Yeah, this Thursday there's a legislative uh, action committee meeting at West Putt. Um, yeah, in two days. And the NISBA folks are going to be down from Albany for that. The general counsel and the person who is uh, heads up their uh, legislative, uh, I'll call it lobbying arm. Um, and uh, the Lower Hudson Council of Superintendents will be represented at our meeting, as will a very active regional uh, parent group. So we're going to try and put our heads together and see how we can support each other in our uh, uh, legislative activities That's going amazing. forward for the year. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Are there any topics for future agendas, requests for information? I got one communication uh, from a college student who's doing research on the history of the school district. 
and I put her in touch with uh, Vince Greco and gave her a couple of other uh, uh, resources that'll help her in her research. Okay. And I asked that uh, you know if and when she puts together a final product, maybe she can share it. Okay. That'd be good. And other communications, I circulated an email that I had gotten from a parent in our community in regard to technology and privacy. And no other communications that I am aware of. Anybody else? Okay. Can I have a motion to approve our board minutes from November 3rd, 2015? So moved. And can I have a second? Second. Were there any changes? All in favor? Thank you, Donna. Okay. And the board, as I said before, met in executive session beforehand to, do, to discuss three items. Uh, 3.1, which was uh, individual employee, let me find it. Uh, 3.1 was a personnel item, individual employee. 3.2, Board of Education Matters, succession planning. And the added 3.3, another personnel item, individual employee. Can I have a motion to adjourn? So. And a second. Second. Okay, all in favor? Good night. Thank you for watching.